ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يدع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصهما فلا يضر الا نفسه اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن علم القران خلق الانسان علمه البيان رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين يا رب العالمين today is going to be a continuation of last week's conversation so the discourse that i was having last week was about the structure of the quran i talked about the fact that the basic unit of the quran is an ayah what is its meaning ayahs come together to make a surah and what is the meaning of the word surah and then i also discussed uh, other aspects of the quran in terms of the the structure of the quran so today i want to continue from there i was talking about different surahs coming in the form of pairs so today i want to start by talking about one more aspect regarding all the quran which is every surah has an umud every surah in the quran has a central theme and the rest of the whole surah revolves around that theme so every surah has a theme every chapter of the quran every surah like i mentioned last week you can't really call a ayah a verse if you properly understand the connotation of the word ayah cuz ayah means sign every sign is a wisdom of allah's uh, every ayah is a sign of allah's wisdom. and i also discussed last week how an ayah is not necessarily a sentence one ayah can be many sentences or or uh one ayah can be half a sentence it is completely upon the hearing the prophet and how he recited quran like ar rahman the most compassionate is one ayah but it's not a sentence it's, it, but it's an ayah it's a complete ayah so I was saying starting today I want to start talking about the fact that every surah has what we call in our mood a central theme. You'll find this very interesting. But the surahs as I said most of the surahs are in pairs. So one surah and another surah they're interlinked with one another and they come together to form a complete subject. <coughs> Let me give you an example. Uh we'll take a, a simple two simple surahs. So the saf and the jumar. So the saf, the central theme of the surah, the main verse around which the whole surah revolves is the ayah huwa alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa din al haq liyudhhirahu ala din kulli wa law kariha al mushrikun. It is Allah who sent his messenger huwa alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda with the guidance which is Quran wa din al haq and the din meaning the system of life that is the truth that's based upon the truth for what reason allah sent the book and the deen and islam why allah sent it liyudhhirahu ala ad-deen kulli so that it will manifest itself over all other systems of life liyudhhirahu ala ad-deen walau kariha al-mushrikun no matter how much the people who want to make partners to allah dislike this this is surah saf this is the central theme the twin surah the surah that complements this the central theme of that surah is هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم. It is Allah who raised a messenger amongst them. And what does he do? What does the Prophet do? As a function of his prophethood, هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته. He recites to them his ayat. ويزكيهم and he purifies them. ويعلمهم الكتاب. He teaches them the book. والحكمة and he teaches them the book. and the wisdom he teaches them the wisdom wala wa in kanu min qabl la fi dalal mubin and before this they were in in law in in astray they didn't know the right from wrong now when the two come together how do they form a pair the prophet has been sent with the quran and with islam to make it superior to make it dominated but then the question comes okay how do you start this process 
How do you start the process of making Islam manifested in the world? The next surah answers this. The Prophet was sent to teach the people the ayat, purify them, teach them the book, the laws and the wisdom. That's the starting point. So that the first surah has the goal. He's been sent to dominate Islam. Okay, so then I want to dominate. Where do I start? How do I start? How do I gather the people together? How do I solidify them? How do I create the brotherhood? That is answered in the next surah. Everyone understands what I'm saying, right? Two surahs. But this surah, the whole surah, it revolves around this ayah. And the other surah it revolves around this, this ayah. But the two come to form a pair. Okay? In the same way, you find a very interesting pair between Sutul uh, Rahman and Sutul Waqi'ah. Sutul Rahman is very nice. The tone is very nice. The tone is very gentle. The same message is there in Sutul Waqi'ah, but the tone is a little bit harsh. Did you bring down the rain? Or we brought down the rain. What do you think you are? You know? So the tone is also complementary sometimes. Now, two surahs, so every surah has a main theme. Two surahs, if, uh, if the surah has a pair, which most surahs do, very few surahs don't have a pair. They come together to form a whole message. Now, what I want to mention after this is this. But there are groups of surahs and particularly seven groups within the whole Qur'an that in which the surahs they come together to form one larger theme and these themes and last week I ended my conversation talking about Makki and Madani surahs if you remember I talked about surahs that were revealed before the Hijra are Makki surahs that were revealed after the Hijra are Madani uh, Madani surahs no matter if he was in Syria or any and the Prophet wherever he was if he was in Uhud or Badr, wherever he was, it's called Madani Surahs. There's one Surah, however, that's in the middle, during the time of the Hijrah. While he was going from Makkah to Medina, there is some difference of opinion about some of the ayat in Sutul Hajj. The last few ayat of Sutul Hajj, they are probably, even though there is a big debate if it's Madani or Makki, but they're most likely revealed while the Prophet was in Hijrah from Makkah to Medina. So would we qualify that as Makki Surah or Madani Surah? This is uh, something we can discuss at another time. But the point I want to make is that every Surah has a central theme. And most of the time, Surahs are in pairs and they come together to complete the theme. And then, like for example, <coughs> then many Surahs come together to form a group. And there are seven of these groups t that are in Quran. Over here, I also want to mention something very important. The 30 juz, or sometimes in the Indian subcontinent, they say para, 30 paras, or 30 ajza, the 30 parts. These are not from the time of the Prophet, nor from the time of the companions. These are something that arbitrarily came into existence at a much later time, and they were done for the purpose of, if somebody wants to finish the whole Quran in 30 days, then he reads one juz every day and in the whole month he finishes the whole reading of the Qur'an but it was a very arbitrary division meaning it was if I dare say a senseless division like for example one of the juz only the first ayah of the first ayah of Surah Hijr that's the end of a juz and the beginning of a new juz so you start a surah you read the whole last surah and then you read only one ayah of Surah Hijr and you're done with your fara you're done with your juz so it was, it was a very arbitrary division that you don't find in the Sunnah of the Prophet nor of the preceding three generations after that. But it was, it's there. And a lot of times we like to you know, make Qur'an easy. The other division you find in Qur'an, which is a lot better than the 30 Jews, is sometimes we call it uh, Ihzab, or sometimes in the Indian subcontinent they call it Ruku. You know, this is this Ruku and this Ruku and this Ruku. This is a better division because they consider, you know, most of the time people don't know this, most of the time the person that's reading the prayers, he would be re finishing the whole Qur'an. So he knows the next prayer I have to do, I'm going to do this Ruku. Every Ruku he would finish one Ruku. 
of the what we usually call in Quran the section or the rukur. So he would like let's say with Dhuhr prayer, he'll finish one ruku in one raka, the second ruku in the second raka, and then in the Asr prayer, he'll continue from where he left off. Right? So that his own Quran is being his own Quran is being reviewed this way. So they have their ahzab, they're following their their one one his, and then the next his, and the next his, like this. So anyway, uh, that also that division, even though much better than the thirty juz, uh, was also done at a later time after the Prophet And What's good about that part is that it keeps intact the subject matter of the Quran for the most part. It keeps it intact. But of course, they keep the subject matter intact. Now. I said now, basically reviewing very quickly, every surah has an umud, a central theme. Two surahs usually come together to form a holistic picture. I'll give you another example just so that it's very clear. Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقْ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ Of the evil he has created in the external world. Right? Surah Al-Falaq is talking about the, all the evils of the external world. Okay, when it's darkness, when the when the thieves are out, when the burglars are out, when people are doing magic, when people are jealous against you, this is also the falah. And then there is the evil that comes from within, which is sudul nas. You fi sudurin nas. The evil that comes from within you, the ashrar or the evil things, the 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 passions, the lust that comes from within you, and the whispers of shaitan and the suggestions that come from within you, that's sudul nas. So the evil from the outside, evil from the inside. They both have a different central theme, but the two come together to form a pair. In this way, many surahs come together to form whole groups of a different theme. So for example, and the reason I was talking about Makki and Madani, these seven groups that are there in the Quran, they are like for example, Surah Al-Fatiha is Makki. Then after that, there is a series of Madni Surahs. Then after that, there is a, again a Makki Surah. So between the Makki and Madni, the beginning of the beginning of a Makki or Madni, and when the next Madni or Makki comes, is one group. So let's say the Fatiha is Makki, Mak, revealed in Makkah. Bakra Madni, Al Imran Madni, Nisa Madni, Maida Madni. The next Surah Makki. So the, from Fatiha to Ma'idah is one group. So this is giving one message. What's interesting is, in the first group, there are three surahs. In the second group, there are five surahs. In the next group, there is seven surahs. Nine and then eleven and then uh, sixty-six. Uh, if I'm correct, if I remember correctly, it's sixty-six. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that they are message, there's a theme, there's an overall theme. So for example, very easy to understand for people that read Quran would understand this. Fatiha and then the four surahs after. Uh, the four surahs after. Okay? The four surahs after that, the main theme is the Sharia of Islam and the creating of the Ummah. Right? Allah created a new Ummah, a new uh, civilization, a new people. They're bound by this Quran, right? And, this, and this is their law, this is their rules and regulations. Most of the laws and regulations in Quran are from Surah Al-Baqarah to Surah Al-Ma'idah. Okay? And then after that, the next theme begins. For example, the last of the seven groups is from Surah Al-Mulk to Surah Al-Nas. And the whole theme of the last group from Surah Al-Mulk to Surah Al-Nas is the Day of Judgment. That's the main theme of the whole group. But from Surah Al-Mulk to Surah Al-Nas, even though that is the main theme of this whole group, but each individual surah also has its main theme. And each pair of surah also complements that theme with its own theme. So two themes coming together to complement one another. Okay, having said this now, what does Qur'an do? Now this is an important topic. Because I'm talking about the structure of Qur'an. And it has to be understood that when we call Qur'an a book, right? Why am I talking about this? It's very important to understand this because a lot of times we look at the Qur'an as the Qur'an talks about something and then it'll talk about the same thing again. Like the story of Adam and 
and uh, Iblis. The story of Adam and Iblis comes in Quran seven times. It comes in Quran because the companions of the Prophet used to, by the way, finish Quran uh, once a week. The whole Quran, the companions of the Prophet used to finish the whole Quran. And they call that seven manazil or seven ihzab, seven groups. And they're almost equal. The ones that the Prophet's companions used to read, they're just about equal seven parts. Uh, so anyway, what I wanted to share with you is that what does Qur'an want? Meaning, when you're reading Qur'an, there are two, three things. The first point I wanted to make is, Qur'an is called a book. But it's not like a normal book. But it is like a normal book in this sense. This is a very important point. That each surah has a theme. And each surah has a main verse, a main ayah upon which that whole theme goes. And in this way, it connects to the next surah. And that surah also has a main theme, a main ayah upon which the whole, even Surah Al-Baqarah is how long? But you can summarize the main theme of Surah Al-Baqarah in a few verses of Surah Al-Baqarah around which the whole surah is moving along. And this is a longer discussion what that would be. But uh, so this is, the Quran is in that sense in the form of a book. That every surah has a main theme. Every main theme of that surah connects to the next surah or to the surah before it. So anyway, um, like I'll give you one more example. So this is very clear. Sutul Muzammil and Sutul Mudassir. Muzammil, Allah says, Ya yuhal Muzammil, O you who's wrapped up in the blanket, Qumil layla illa qalila. Stand up all night and do what? Read Quran all night. Qumil layla illa qalila, nisfahu aw infus minhu qalila, aw zida alayhi waratilil Qur'ana tartila. Right? Over there again, he's told to stand up, but at night. In Surah Al-Muzammil. Ya Yuhul Muzammil, Qumil Layl. Stand up at night. Surah Al-Muzammil, Surah Al-Mudathir. Ya Yuhul Muzammil, Qum. Over there is Ya Yuhul Muzammil, Qumil Qum. Same. Ya Yuhul Muzammil, who's wrapped up in the blanket, stand up. Ya Yuhul Muzammil, who's wrapped up in the blanket, stand up. Same. Ya Yuhul Muzammil, قُمِلْ لَيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا نِصْفَهُ أَوْ إِنْقُسْ مِنْهُ قَلِيلًا أَوْ زِدَ عَلَيْهِ وَرَدْتِلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِلًا Standing up at night, but the standing up in the day is what? يَا يُوهَ الْمُدَثِرْ قُمْ فَأَنْذِرْ Stand up and warn the people. قُمْ فَأَنْذِرْ وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ And your goal is to make Allah Akbar. Your goal is to make Allah the most supreme. Your goal is to make Allah the most high. وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ وَثَيَابَكَ فَتَّحِرْ the, uh, the surah continues. But the point is, I'm trying to show the complementary nature of the two surahs. The complementary nature of the two surahs. The two surahs come together to form a pair. This is very important to understand because everyone who wants to understand Qur'an as a book of guidance has to have some understanding of these basic themes that the Qur'an wants. <coughs> now, <coughs> how does the Qur'an work? Qur'an works at two different levels in terms of the human being. <coughs> First is that Qur'an saad wal Qur'ani the dhikr. It works as a dhikr. Reminder. What does it mean to be a reminder? <coughs> Why Quran calls itself zikr? Nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu We send down the reminder and we will be its protector. A dhikr is Quran. But why? This is very important to know because this will tell you the function of Quran. What does Quran want to remind you about what? <coughs> Quran reminds us of our own basic nature. Listen to what I'm about to say. Dhikr means you forgot something and you're, it brings it back to your memory. You forgot something and you have to bring something back to your... This is remembrance. What did man forget? Man forgot Allah. Man forgot He is in this world temporarily. Man forgot that He has a moral law within Man forgot that this world could be an illusion, this world can be a temptation, that this world can take him in the wrong direction. Man forgets these things. 
And when you read Quran, that but this knowledge is a priori. The knowledge of this is already within you. But it's been suppressed. It's been forgotten. It's been put in the back of your mind. You know, out of out of out of out of sight, out of mind, right? So if you don't keep certain basic ideas in the front of your mind, they'll go to the back of your mind. Quran tries to bring some basic ideas to the front of your mind so that when you're viewing the world around you, you have those realities before you. Oh, this world will come to an end. My life is temporary, right? Uh, nations, they rise and the nations, they fall. This happens with all nations. Not all nations going to be on top forever. So these are basic themes of Quran that the Quran wants to bring something that's already within you. It's like, uh, I'll give you an example. If there's a beautiful flute, maybe this is a bad example, but let's say it's deep in the ground, right? So you dig the ground and you find the flute or you find the treasure that's in the ground. Digging this out, this process of bringing out something that's already there. It's there, but it is, needs to be brought out. This is a dhikr This is remembrance. Reminding, uh, Allah says something very interesting in Quran. Dhikrukum, uh, in the Quran is your remembrance. You find yourself in Quran. Read Quran and find yourself. You'll, you'll hit an eye of the Quran and you'll be like, wow, that's, so me. That reminds me so much of me. This is what reminds me of me. And I'll give you a very good example of that. Again, time has run out <clears throat> and I have to catch my flight, but I just want to give this example. I want to talk, finish this part and then inshallah we'll see where it goes from there if I want to continue on this subject or not. But I'll give you this example. There is an atheist, right? What is the biggest problem an atheist has in believing in God? What's the biggest problem an atheist has? The biggest objection an atheist has is why is there so much suffering in the world? If there's God, why does he allow so much suffering, right? An atheist says, well, if there's God, then why does he allow babies to die, right? Why does God allow bad things to happen? And so an atheist is reading Quran, right? Now an atheist is reading Quran. This person I'm talking about is an actual person. His name is Dr. Jeffrey Lang. He's a mathematician in the University of California. He was given a Quran by, his, by one of his students. He, he was an atheist. He didn't want to believe in God. He thought, you know, uh, he thought basically, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but there was a person in, I forget which state, in, in this country, in, in uh, one of, I think Wisconsin, or, or you can look this up on the internet, there was one of the politicians, he sued God that there's so much corruption in the world that I need to sue God. Now it sounds funny, but this is how the mentality of the atheist is, is, you know, God needs to be sued for all the bad things that happen. And so the point I'm trying to make is, so there's a professor of mathematics reading the Quran for the first time, right? And he finds himself in the very beginning. And the ayah that struck him and he was like just jolted by it he was like wow right he reads the verses uh, Allah said to the angels I'm going to create on the world a khalifa and the angels said his objection his objection was are you going to create in the world someone who's going to do chaos and shed blood. This is, this is exactly the, the problem the atheist has. In fact, I'll just connect it with something else just so you understand. Communism, which is the religion of trying to make everything equal, right? Everyone, whether you're a doctor or you're uh, a businessman or a teacher, you all get the same, what, pay, right? That's what communism is. And that idea that let's be just to everybody, let's be fair, absolutely fair to everybody, let's make everything equal, is connected to the idea or the idea of there's no God. Because God can't do justice, so let us do... Communism, you know, is part of its main thoughts is there's no God. And so part of it is, okay, since there's no God, let's just make everything what? Equal, right? Anyway, the point I'm trying to make, it, make here is that, so this professor, Dr. Jeffrey Lang, he's reading Quran, and he finds this verse. Are you going to make someone in it that will cause uh, cause chaos and shed blood? And he's like, that ayah, that verse, that's me. That's my whole life. 
I've been resisting God because of this same complaint that this angel... So he finds himself in the Qur'an. So dhikr is the idea of, number one, bringing out certain moral things that you already know. They're, they're already there and they come out. But then there's a higher connection where you kind of find yourself. And you're like, this part of the Qur'an defined my whole life. This part of the Qur'an like defined who I was. Right? And, and that is... It brings out a very powerful religious emotion. Now again, I didn't even get close to finishing today, but I want to finish by uh, mentioning something um, very important. And then we'll inshallah do the second khutbah and pray. Um, okay, I do have time. <coughs> the second element, so what is Qur'an wants? Dhikr. The second and the more detailed uh, thing the Qur'an wants is أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّهُونَ Quran. Do you not ponder over Qur'an? You can say dhikr is like if there's a sea, you know the surface of the sea? This is, this is what Allah wants to bring from the ground up, right? So it's on the surface of the sea. You can, things like, for example, there's a day of judgment. Things like I should fear God. Things I should make right choices. Things like there is an evil that's trying to take me to the wrong way. Things like, you know, things in this life are temporary. كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانِ Everything will perish, right? كُلُّ ذَائِكَ تَلْمَوْتِ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِكَ تَلْمَوْتِ Everyone will taste death. The basic, this is like on the surface of the ocean. But تَدَبُّر تَدَبُّر means diving deep in that ocean and finding the pearls and the jewels deep in the ocean. So the Qur'an is like an endless ocean in which you can dive deep into and also bring out the treasures of that ocean. So at one level, Qur'an is dhikr, on that surface level. Even if you read a basic translation of Qur'an, even if you read a basic translation of Qur'an, it will bring some basic message of Qur'an to your mind. Oh, this is the message of Qur'an. Right? And if you want to know more, if you want to do tadabbur, if you want to dive deep into the Qur'an, then you have to know the central theme of each surah. How it connects to the surah before, how it connects to the surah prior to that, and how the surahs are interrelated when this will help you dive deep into the surah and to bring out its miracles. Inshallah, I'll end in my second khutbah. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. إمام شعبي لا محدث دل برحمة الله عليه in his very 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 great book فوز الكبير في أصول التفسير he mentions about this aspect of ذكر I want to mention this before I finish. There are two types of ذكر or two levels of ذكر within the Quranic structure. One is tazkir bi ala illa. Remembering Allah by His creation and His power and His might and His majesty and His awesomeness that you see in the world around you. So, this is one level of Quran. When you're reading Quran, Quran never is bringing you into Quran as much as it is also taking you outside Quran. Oh, look at this. Ashams wal qamaru bi husban. The sun and the moon are following their calculated paths. So as you're reading Qur'an, it's also taking you to the outside world. So into the world of creation, right? For example, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, right? <coughs> in Surah Al-Mulk, Allah says, uh, go look, uh, look at the sky. Until, and you will look at the sky and my creation until you're tired. And then, uh, and then Allah says, no, no, go look again. And you'll be tired again, right? So uh, this... Remembering Allah or reminding of Allah, or reminding of basic realities by nature and the power of nature. Because there are two types of miracles. One type of miracle is the miracle of the things that we see, right? It's miraculous that I take water and I put sugar in it and it becomes a sugary water. That's nature at its work is a miracle in itself. 
And this is one of the Quran, you know, everyone's like, oh, I want to see a miracle. But the Quranic theme is, don't you see nature, everything is fault, like ashams wal qamaru bi husban, the sun and the moon, they follow their calculated orbits. The fact that everything follows a definite law in nature is a miracle in itself. Right? And so the Quran is pointing towards this at one level, and then there are other levels of miracles, which like the Prophet's doing a miracle, for example. So Tazkib bi ala illa remembering Allah or being reminded of Allah through his Allah is pointing to look at what He's given you, look at the animals around you, for example, as mentioned in Quran, right? So this, all this, is creation. Look at it. And then, the second is تَذْكِيرْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ Remembering Allah through His days, through history, through the process of history. That how nations rise, how nations fall, as I've mentioned before. Remembering Allah through, when Allah is telling you the stories of Musa, right? The most repeated story in the Qur'an, the most emphasized story in the Qur'an is the story of Musa and Fir'aun. It's the most mentioned story in the Qur'an. So that becomes an archetype, an icon, a template for the rest of history to be looked at through. Right? It, it becomes a way of knowing how Allah functions in history. And how Allah makes the the evil ones go down and the good ones come up as a process of history. And within Tazkir bi Ayyamillah is Amba Rusul, meaning that when a messenger comes, you have to believe him. If you don't believe him, there will be repercussions for that community that chose not to believe him. This is also there, and then in the case of the Prophet, there's, it comes with certain rules. Anyway, <clears throat> the point I'm trying to make is, so there's Dhikr and there's the Dabbur. And so you read Qur'an to, ha to bring to your mind, to, to the consciousness of your mind, certain realities. Over here I want to bring something to your attention, inshallah I'll finish after that. Uh, time is up for me I think. Um, yeah, I'll mention this and you'll find this interesting. I think you'll find this all beneficial. There's been a lot of studies on willpower. I'm about to share with you a miracle of the Prophet a miracle given by the Prophet. I'm going to say two things. I'm going to say two things and try to say it fast. There's been a lot of studies on willpower. And one of the things that we realize about willpower is that the essence of willpower is attention. If you focus on something, for example, I'll give you an example. It's time to pray. I know it's time to pray. Now I have one of the two things I can do. Either I can make myself forget, put it in the back of my mind, it's time to pray, but I don't want to pray, so I don't want to, I know my thoughts are saying I need to pray, my feelings are saying don't, I don't feel like praying. So what am I going to do? Generally, you're going to go with your feelings and not with your thoughts, right? So what you do is you put, you let your thoughts go, you make yourself forget, you make yourself Forget. Dhikr is the idea of making yourself remember. And over here I also want to share with you another very interesting thing very quickly. One of the, one of the miracles of the human being is, the, uh, is memory. Because what happens, how do we have memory is one of the mysteries. Okay, because every cell eventually what? Dies. Right? Every cell eventually dies. And so how do we keep memory in our mind if all the cells are always what? dying. If the cells are dying, how do I keep my memory? And so there are two, three explanations, but they're not definite explanations because if my brain, if all the cells in my brain are being replaced in X amount of days, how do I know my, how do I have this ontological consciousness of the self? This is very interesting because there's no explanation to this. Because if, if all my skin cells die, all my blood cells die, okay, we understand they get replaced. But if my memory is in my brain, and my brain, the synapses get replaced, every, every, everything working with them gets replaced, then how does memory stay constant? How does memory stay constant? This is a big miracle, of, and it's very interesting because of the, the amount of times Qur'an mentions memory, and how it relates to, uh, like for example, memory is related to sins in the Qur'an, which 
connects to this, this will be a subject I'll talk about it another time. But I was only touching about, uh, on this. But the main point I was trying to make was, is that willpower comes from focusing on something, putting your attention upon something. So when you know, oh, I have to pray, it's a thought. I have to pray. But if you don't feel like praying, your feelings say, no, don't pray. Your thought says, you have to pray. But if this is the essence of willpower. But if you keep, if you don't let go the thought, if you don't let yourself forget, if you keep focusing and no, I have to pray, it's time to pray, you start thinking, if I don't pray, what will happen? And if I do pray, this might be the prayer that puts me in Jannah. If I don't pray, this might be the prayer that puts me in the hellfire. Right? And you start focusing on that thought that you shouldn't let go. This is the essence of willpower. When you don't let that thought go, and you keep asking different things about it. Okay, how can I pray? Okay, what's my first step to prayers? What's my second step to prayers? How should I pray? Where will I like to pray? You keep asking yourself about that thing that you want to forget because your feelings are saying, I don't feel like doing this, right? But you, when you have that thought, you keep it and you keep talking to that thought. So your feelings say don't pray, your thought says you need to pray. You have two choices, either you can let it go, you forgot. Or you can keep that in your mind and keep focusing on it. And this is the essence of willpower. Willpower is not giving up. Not what? Giving up the thought. But focusing on the thought till you can ask yourself, for example, how, will, how good will I feel, feel when I finish praying? You know, you feel good when you finish praying because you feel like you did something important. So, or there's a spiritual enlightenment that comes in. You know, as-salatul nur, the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the point I'm trying to make here is this, is that Qur'an is a book that forces you, when you're reading Qur'an, Qur'an forces you to remember the things that sometimes you want to forget. Because you're so involved in dunya, you're so involved in your business, you're so involved in your careers, you're so involved in your family life, and in all the things in the world, you just want, you don't feel like it. And if you read Qur'an, it'll make you focus on the thoughts, and it'll create emotions for that thought. Because when it's talking about hellfire, when it's talking about Jannah, when it's describing the good things that'll be the result of being good, and it's when describing the bad things and the result of being bad, then your emotions begin to change. And you begin to focus that thought, then is no longer a thought, it actually becomes a feeling, yeah, I do want to pray. I do want to pray to Allah. And so that's the essence of willpower. And the Prophet said this, a very miraculous statement. The Prophet said, actions are by intentions. If you focus on something, it will lead you into action. What happens is, a lot of times, our feelings say, oh, I don't feel like praying, but our thoughts saying pray. Or our feelings are saying, I don't want to study, but our thoughts are saying study. And which one usually will win? Our feelings will win over thought. Until you learn to focus on that thought and force yourself to do what you normally wouldn't want to do. And so that's the essence of willpower that I wanted to end with, at least for now.